thanks everybody again for coming. I, this is our uh, our third one in the second half of the year, and uh, um, really excited to have Mary and Corey on the um, clinic with us tonight. And uh, I know he's excited to speak to a lot of the coaches in a pretty interesting and relevant topic. And uh, I think he's an excellent person to discuss this topic. Um, again, he's had a ton of experience being a coach, mentor, player, mentor at uh, with Team Alberta and. Hockey Canada as well too with National Women's Program and then uh, U17 as well and uh, has coached both in female and male side and has coached young ones and old ones and all sorts of levels. So, uh, and then most recently Barry um, had won a Hockey Canada Award uh, uh, this year, 2020 uh, recipient of the Gordon Jucks or Jukes, Jukes Award, yeah, for his uh, outstanding development in uh, with the national program. So. I'm pretty excited to have Barry here and uh, I know we can kind of keep it a little bit more engaging tonight through uh, the group chat. So if there is ever any questions, just put them in the group chat and I will, I will manage those uh, for Barry. But uh, thank you again for coming and uh, I'll give you the spotlight now. Oh, thanks. I, I really appreciate you, uh, you asking Joel. And one of the things he had said to begin with was, you know, have I done any of these before I've done lots and because I work with our, our teams and our, our high performance programs with Hockey Alberta now, um, I haven't really worked worked for quite a while uh, just because of all that's gone on. And so one of the things, I, I'm a lifelong learner, at least I, I like to think that I am. So I've tried to create um, work for myself. So doing this has given me an opportunity to, to research, to talk to lots of different people and then obviously share my findings with others. Um, certainly, I don't know everything. Um, as I go through the presentation tonight, I looked at the questions that, that uh, you guys had posed. Some of you put some things down. Uh, so I've tried to answer them uh, through the presentation. A lot of it I'd hit on, but there was a few that it's like, no, I better put something in on that. Um, I try and keep it engaging for you guys so that you don't fall asleep. You can't throw things at me here. Um, which is positive, I guess, on my behalf. Uh, another good part of this is um, you can sit back and have a beer or do whatever you want as it ends up going on near the comfort of your home and hopefully the warmth of it. And uh, so hopefully you take some things out of it. I will share the, uh, the PowerPoint with Joel after and I put together a resource package and I'll talk more about that um, later on. Uh, I started putting it together when COVID first hit and doing these sessions because coaches would ask, hey, do you have something on this or can you share something on that? Uh, so I've got a ton of stuff. Most of it is uh, off ice uh, ideas and opportunities with kids. So again, I'll hit on that as we go, but that's just uh, two reminders that you might wanna take notes, but you don't have to because you'll get this if you want it later on. So I, I called it rising above and, and I guess, it's my why to, to doing this and hopefully some of yours too is we, we've had a really tough year. And when I say we, we as coaches, we as parents, me as a grandparent, um, the kids, everybody. And a lot of them are searching now for what their why is. Uh, some of them uh, may not even be interested in coming back to play. They're into other things and others are just chomping at the bit to get going. But uh, if you've watched any Simon Sinek stuff or read any of his books, one of the things that you'll you'll find is the importance of knowing why you're doing something. And those of you that I've taught or coached before, I've always used the word purpose in everything that I do. What's the reason why you're doing it? And what are you going to try and get out of it? So the why leads to other things. So the rising above simply means for us uh, is to get above all of the stuff that's going on, and especially now with the government making some changes again on Saturday and how can we end up making the rest of this year successful for everyone. I put in some books there that I've read all talking about culture and the importance of you guys understanding that you're under the guise of Hockey Edmonton but you're also under the guise of your minor hockey association that you work with but then also you should have built a culture with your with your team uh, whether it was at the start of the season prior to COVID, uh, whether it's been throughout COVID. And again, I'll hit some of this as I go through it, but just that whole thing about who are you and where are you gonna take this? 
uh, over the course of the next six to eight weeks, depending on how much ice time there is available and how much you get out of it. So we want to rise above. Uh, we want to build, continue to build our culture. And as coaches, I guess we want to end up getting better. I don't think this guy needs any introduction. And uh, as he ends up saying that it's not, you know, that you're getting hit and how many times you're getting hit and how many times you fall down, but it's that you're gonna, you're gonna get up and keep moving forward. And I think that's really important for us to understand just like Rocky did that if you wanna be successful, you're gonna end up getting bloodied and battered throughout the whole thing. Uh, and again, whether it's, uh, you know, the COVID thing or a hundred other things that have gone on as a result of it, but let's keep moving forward. So again, that rising up is, is critical for us. <clears throat> the word pivoting, I was gonna put a whole bunch of video in uh, to show you guys pivots in hockey and the reasons why uh, we teach players how to pivot properly, whether it's uh, forwards to backwards or backwards to forwards or uh, sideways, uh, uh, heel to heel, any of those sorts of things. And so we kind of get a gist of it if you're, uh, if you're a coach and you're thinking of the skill side of pivoting, and it sort of means the same thing in real life and what we're ending up going through right now. Um, I put two pictures up there. The first one is a book by Brian Tracy called Flight Plan. And in it, he speaks and, and what hit me is you hop on an airplane and uh, you get in, you buckle up, uh, they fly you from A to B. You think that as soon as a plane takes off, um, that they put it on autopilot and then they, they take the controls before they land. Well, unbeknownst to us, they change flight uh, patterns and plans probably a few hundred times in the time that you can fly from here to Toronto. And it could be total different reasons, whether it's birds in the air or the wind or whatever else. And so there's always stuff going to go on. I call it thunderbolts, so things that end up happening. It's a really good book to read as well. If you're just thinking that all you need to do as a person is prepare, have a good plan, and things are going to go well, because they don't. You're going to have to end up pivoting. You're going to have to make changes. <laughs> Excuse me. The other book on the, on the right-hand side is one of my all-time favorites. It's about four mice that are in a maze. And uh, they each have a different personality. And obviously, as mice, they need to eat and they love cheese. And uh, as the book goes on, the, the, the cheese moves on them. And as you can end up seeing in there, and this is the one page that sort of explained the handwriting in the wall, everything that happened in the book. But change happens. Uh, you've got to anticipate that it's going to happen. And obviously, now with us and COVID, uh, we've experienced that more than once. We've got to be able to monitor it. We've got to be able to adapt. We have to change. And at the end of the day, we have to enjoy the change and get ready to change again and again. And you guys can see, I work with Hockey Alberta and we were the same as you guys for months with nothing happening. Um, and then suddenly on last Thursday, they make an announcement that there can be 10 people on ice. So my senior leadership group spent a day, over a day getting prepared, sent stuff out uh, later on Thursday and Friday for everybody in the province and then they got another email on Saturday morning uh, that it changed again on them. And so they ended up having to redo a whole bunch of stuff to get it out again. Uh, the media hasn't been so happy and polite to us, especially Twitter with people that don't understand and, and it's unfortunate. Uh, we didn't make those decisions, but certainly from our side, all of us that work at Hockey Alberta, this word pivot, uh, we've certainly learned in the last year that we have to be very adaptable uh, to things and, and understand that change is gonna happen and then how are we going to adapt to it and accept it as it is. A big key for us as coaches to recognize and understand is that diagram in the left-hand side. And I, I've done lots and lots of seminars, probably like a bunch of you guys, I've learned tons of stuff from them. And this one came out maybe three weeks ago. It was um, a three-day seminar put on by a national coaching group. And the one session was exactly on this as athletes of today <laughs> and reasons why they drop out. And there's a number of slides that came up. I just have the very last slide on there. But it talks about why kids quit. And it could be from low personal accomplishments. So they're not doing what they need to do. They don't feel confident and happy about what's going on. Um, so at the end of the day, it's like, uh, we're going to drop out. Another one is emotional exhaustion. 
And that one there, and when they talked about it, an appreciation from the coach. And in a big part of it, that's what it is. That's that mental health piece, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that certainly happens. And right now, if we as a coach haven't really done much with our players uh, in the last three months, uh, we could be facing that now that we're going back. When you email, text, Snapchat with your group, half of them may have bought out because you haven't done much of anything with them. So it could be just that emotional whole thing where they don't even want to be part of it anymore. The physical exhaustion, well, that one there, obviously, from our point of view anyways, as coaches, isn't going to be there other than maybe the appraisal from the coach. And again, that's one where during a season, if we're going to be negative to the kid, uh, they may not like that. And then the other one is just the negative feelings towards the sport, uh, the whole trust commitment piece. And in a lot of cases, and I know with my poor grandkids, uh, they, they're still doing some skating and that, as you can see in the middle picture, but they're doing a whole bunch of other things as well, uh, other sports and reading more and doing stuff like that, so that hockey maybe isn't quite as important to them now. So it leads me to the book, Before the Lights Go Out. Not sure if you've read that one, but it's a must read for you as a coach because it talks about the fact that uh, we're in a situation now where uh, hockey, I don't know if it's Canada's game anymore. Um, we have a lot of new people that have moved into the country with the cost of hockey, uh, with them coming from places that maybe hockey and ice and everything wasn't even there. They have no use for wanting their kids to try and play it. So there's a whole bunch of demographics in that that come in, but the guy that wrote the book is exceptional. There's also a uh, podcast out that he's put out talking about it. Uh, so it's another one um, that uh, if you're interested, just to get a bit of a nibble on what the book's about, but it's there. And again, it's all about hockey for life. We want to make sure that the lights never go out with our game. And so a big part of it I'm throwing at you, and I've broken this presentation down into a num number of different areas. And this is sort of that first one. It's going to be a personal challenge to you as a coach. Where are you and where do you want to end up going with all of this so that the lights don't go out? <clears throat> Excuse me, what the players need and uh, what could and should we do to, to end up helping them? Well, what's the purpose of the rest of the year for us? And I think that's the first one that we need to understand and recognize is if we've done things with them, and again, some of it might depend on the age that the kids are at and what you could have done from a team building perspective just to keep them together as a group. And a lot of my presentations, Joel, in the last few months, that's what they've been on is how can we engage our players to a lot of different things. And so you'll see in a lot of the resource package that I've prepared, there's a lot of that stuff. And I'll get into that later on too. But if you haven't done a lot of the team building, you may have to pivot and either not worry about it or do a whole bunch more in the next four to six weeks to get these kids thinking again that they're a team. Or you take a look at it in a completely different context and approach, and you're going to run your practices based on skill base, and that's it. So you're going to work on those sort of things and not worry so much about the team aspect of it. They're still going to come out. Yeah, you can yap with them and do things, but that's not as important. Honestly, I can tell you, though, when you look at that middle circle, when you see what kids do, and this was from a survey, the six things as to why kids like to play the game, to enjoy it and have fun, to do something they're good at, to improve their skills, to exercise and stay in shape, to be part of a team, and the last one, the excitement of competition. We could have and maybe should have been involved with five of those six things. And maybe even the six that were good enough with off ice activities that we could have made them compete in different ways and things. And I'll get into that later on in the presentation too. But that's why kids are playing. That's why they wanna play the game. That's why they play any sport is for those six reasons. And I think it's important for us as coaches to recognize that's the important stuff to them. There's a story I read a long time ago and it's about a, a cookie and this little guy, he's probably six or seven, keeps asking the coach, he's got a question and the coach keeps telling him, focus on the game, focus on the game. And finally, when the game's over, the coach says, so what did, what did you want, Johnny? And Johnny said, I want to know what kind of cookies we're getting after the game. And we don't recognize as coaches the importance some of that stuff is for kids. And what we think we're looking through our eyes 
uh, we're not looking through the kids' eyes and we're not helping them to be motivated. That other video that was put out a number of years ago about big ice and those guys were on a 300 foot ice pad with huge soccer nets and all of that. If you've ever seen that one's another way of getting perspective of the kids too. The bottom one is Simon Sinek's why. And uh, again, we have to know our why and the kids why. So that's that motivation piece to get them going. So to me, if you're looking for advice tonight, this is the first one in this slide is why are your kids coming back to your practice? What do they want out of it? Because that'll give you your process or your how, and it'll also give you your what or the product. If they're coming back to be with their 18 buddies, it doesn't matter what you do on the ice with them. They just wanna get back and be part of that team. If they're coming back because they wanna improve in their skating and stick handling, you got a completely different what and how that you're looking at and a different why as well, although they wanna come back. So to me, that would be the very first thing is you need to do a survey of some sort with the kids and the parents and find out why they're coming back. And that'll help you to plot all of the rest of what you're gonna end up doing moving forward. <clears throat> so I wanna talk a little bit about mental fitness and um, you guys can read too, but I'll just flip through it for you. But obviously it's the ability to regulate your the thoughts and feelings and behaviors and to act in a purposeful and consistent manner, um, coping with all the things that they're going through right now. So we want them to feel good and have the ability to feel good with all of the pressures and circumstance that they've been faced with in the last little bit. And so the, the aim of developing mental fitness is to maximize performance. So if the kids come in and their why is, hey, we want to get better at stick handling and, and passing and shooting, uh, but they're not working hard at it or they're not mentally fit right now. They're just down and out. Probably no matter how hard you plan and how hard you organize and you do things, they're not going to catch on to it. We want to engage them in quality training. Well, that one can be an easy one for us with that mental fitness piece, especially if they come in a little bruised up. We can help that through feedback and positive comments and things of that nature. Maybe some team building on the ice and off the ice, doing some relays and stuff like that where they can actually team build on the ice and feel good about it and compete, but excuse me, in a different sort of a way. To maintain a healthy level of well-being, I'll tell you, I, I work with our provincial teams. Uh, I do the mental performance for them as well. And those kids, uh, the, the guys are 15 and the girls are 15 to 17. Every one of them has a lot of issues. They all do. And again, we'll get a little bit more into that, but their mental fitness coming into a lot of these things is not good. And they're so worried and concerned about doing well and being the best that they can be and the parent pressures and scout pressures and all of that, their mental fitness is not strong. And that's older kids that are high level kids and high level athletes. And a big one with mental fitness is that resilience piece. If you've read anything by Duckworth on grit, she talks about persistence and passion being the two really important components. When we talk about being successful in life, not just in sports, that resilience piece is so huge. You take a, a beach ball that's filled up, bounce it on the floor, it's going to come back to you. It's resilient. If you only half fill it, you might have to bend over to pick it up when it hits the floor. If you take all the air out of it, it's not bouncing at all. It's just sitting there. And again, if we get kids that are coming in now that that ball is only half full or deflated, look at the job we have to do. They have no resilience to what's been going on. So part of our job as a coach is going to be how can we help them to end up building that resilience back up again and that passion. Well, one of the things that we can do, and I'm taking you through some of the mental performance stuff that I talk to kids about too, is a mental toughness. And uh, the... the uh, there's lots of stuff out on it. I was just trying to think of the show that Lone Survivor that really talked about mental toughness and, and how the SEALs teach and train their, their people to get through it. But basically what it is, is how do we teach people to deal effectively with the stressors, the pressures, the challenges, and yet to perform the best of their abilities, no matter what the circumstance that they're in. So we want them to be the best that they can be all the time, no matter what is thrown at them. And again, the word thunderbolt comes up when I use that. So <clears throat> you notice a picture in the background. The, the first one obviously is a COVID one, but the, the bigger general blue picture is of a train wreck, a derailment. 
And I read another book and I got the idea of this slide from it that we've been in a derailment for a year, almost like the last of last year and most of this season, give or take that train's gotten back on the tracks a little bit and then fallen off again and sort of got back and fallen off again. And now we're sort of back on. So it's huge to have that mental toughness when this stuff's going on, especially if you're an 11 year old or a 15 year old and it's your draft year and you're a boy or you're 17 and a girl and you're looking for a scholarship somewhere. All of those things are really tough on them. And so again, we have to find ways to be able to help them out. The hockey landscape, like I said, completely changed. And then what are the family values and the parent values and the player values? They're a little bit different too. And again, it's based somewhat on where they are in their life and where they want to end up being as they end up going. So when we talk mental toughness, we talk about the four C's of being mentally tough. And again, this isn't on a mental toughness presentation. I could give you a whole hour on it. I just tried to give you one slide to give you a hint. So the first one is the challenge piece. How can we help players to effectively deal with the adversity going on? How do we give them, how do we help them with the confidence to be able to work through it and end up coming through and being successful in whatever they want to do? How do we help them be committed to what those top two are, that confidence piece and the ability to meet that challenge? And then how do we teach them how to control uh, the circumstance that they're in? And again, the beauty of this presentation is about five slides from now, I'll show you how you can do that. But those, when we talk about mental toughness, those are the four keys uh, to having a mentally tough athlete. If they can handle those four things and be confident in that in it, you're gonna find that they're gonna bounce out of it. So we've gotta find a way to help these kids in the next six to eight weeks and us as coaches, because a lot of us have been derailed too. Can't lie to you, there's days that I wake up and it's like, ah, oh, I sure wish I could be at a rink or working with kids or going to Red Deer to meetings or whatever else. So it's all hit all of us, but we have to be mentally strong to keep our mental well being uh, going forward. So again, another session that I went to, it was all about attacking new opportunities. Let's think of this whole thing as a new opportunity this next six weeks. We're gonna be out of our comfort zone. The slide on the left part there, it says, how do I need to show up so I can raise the bar? We did a session a number of years ago at Hockey Alberta called Above and Below the Line. And this is so close to it. You can be below the line, you can blame things, you can rationalize, you can avoid stuff, you need an explanation why, any of those things, and you take a look at it and it says, I can't because, and you've all heard that thing, if you think you can't, you can't. Go to above the bar or above the line, how do I raise it? And if you think you can, then you can do it. So what is it that you wanna do? Take some initiative, set a plan, execute and evaluate. So it's a little cycle that, again, it's up to you. Do you want to be above the bar or do you want to be below the bar? And again, I said, this whole thing is about rising up. I think we all want to be above the bar and that's why you're on this tonight. Another book in the first little check mark below, it's called Extreme Ownership. And it's a SEALs book uh, on, on leadership and ownership. And they talk about in this book, you have to own everything. You have to be the role model for what's going on. And it's so important for us to have that mindset that it's about us, it's about how we can help the others, it's about not accepting uh, anything other than our best and moving forward. So again, that find out what it is, execute, and then evaluate to see if it's ended up working out. We gotta be out of the box with our thinking. And the big one here that I'm looking at, and as I told people even before, uh, presentations when we didn't have this ice is how can you become a better skills coach through this pandemic as we're working through it you can go online you can you can listen to different presentations Joel said last week that Zipper was exceptional and he is he's he's a great teacher and he's a great coach young and everything but he certainly got the skill Joel's another one that can spend hours talking to you about how to stick handle and shoot and things like that most of us aren't good skill coaches, we're coaches. And I learned years ago when I started coaching our national women's team that they wanted to get better even at that level because they didn't wanna lose. And so my job 
was those little wee things that needed to end up getting better. I had to be good enough at it to help them to get better. So it was a personal challenge that I took on myself. So how can you in the next six weeks, because basically that's what it's down to, is what can we do from a skills perspective and a fun perspective, help our kids? So to me, how do we become a better skills coach? What are some of the things that we can end up doing that are going to be able to help us in it? And you look at that messy hands with the paint, that's what we've got right now. We've got a group of kids that they can, you can mold them into whatever you want in the next six weeks, however many sessions you have whether it's two, whether it's six, whatever it happens to be. Again, sky's the limit. It's just up to us to be above the bar, above that line, own everything, that extreme ownership piece, and start thinking outside the box of how can we end up getting better. So what I took the liberty of doing is uh, creating a job description for you. And to me, I, I think, and Joel, this is one from your side of it too. We talked the other day that I think is really important is what are the things that are sort of must in the next while that you guys are gonna be stepping on the ice with players. So here's where I sort of changed um, what I've done. Like the first part was on the mental and the coach. So now I'm into a little bit more of the actual practical stuff. So the first one I think is super important is we all gotta do our job. We have to make sure all the safety protocols are followed. Don't bullshit people and, uh, and be one foot away from kids and have eight standing in a line waiting for everybody to go. If that's your style of coaching is one at a time and you're making them wait, I'll give you some ideas coming up on how you can stagger them. But we have to be aware of all of those and we have to follow them. If we get inspectors coming into rinks and see it's not being followed, and they've told us at Hockey Alberta that if coaches don't follow it, they're going to shut us down again. And it might be one rink, it might be 10 they need to see. We have no idea. They just told us to make sure that our coaches know that. So that would be a huge safety protocol. Make sure you're wearing your mask. Make sure with the dressing room protocol. Make sure with your the parents that are allowed in or not allowed in, like all of that stuff. And again, Joel and the minor hockey systems that are in Edmonton will give you all of that information. But to me, that's number one is your job description. That's your job is to make sure those things are going to be followed. How are you gonna utilize the ice? So again, you can do circuits, you can do stations. Uh, how can you end up setting things up so once the kids get going, they can do it on their own? And when I look at this one and I put that one in, if I'm coaching a U7 or a U9 team, probably I'm not gonna be able to do a lot of teaching if there's nine kids on the ice and me. It's almost impossible to give feedback in that. So I could set the practice up that I'm going to show them a skill and they're going to do a circuit and go through it. And there's very little interaction by me. It's more them just doing it over repetitions. So you could set it up that way and make it easy. You're getting lots of ice efficiency and you're doing lots of things there. You could set it up for one practice. If you used to having two teams share the ice, just have all the forwards out one practice. And all you're doing with coaches from both teams is working with the forwards on forward skills. Another practice all D, another one all goalies, or combine them all. So again, there's different ways of being able to think and do it. Don't settle on the easiest, simplest way. I, I would urge you to phone other coaches, talk to the people, especially those that are sharing ice and have all year. I don't know how it's going to be set up in Edmonton. So every group's going to be different. But find that out and then find ways to plan together with one another. Curriculum prioritization, what's their skill level? Like what can they do and where do you want to take them in the next six weeks? You're not going to get a ton out of them. Any of you that have read anything on mastery and there's a ton of books out now on talent code and one another one called mastery in that, it's a lot of hours of practice so that you get that muscle memory in there. So whatever you're teaching them is going to be for the now. It's not going to be totally for next year unless they're going to be on the ice all summer and they're gonna have you or somebody that's gonna be teaching the same thing. So what you're trying to do is not reinventing a wheel or creating a whole new one, but just building on things that they've got already. So skill level certainly is there, the age that they are, depending on how old or how young they are, like you might be able to get away with one coach and nine kids on the ice. The younger, I would suggest you had two and eight at least. So, and we know why it's not just teaching, it's also making sure that they stand where they're supposed to and listen. And, all of those things. So it's a little bit more hands-on and also the needs of the kids. Where, where are they right now coming in? 
the importance of that and understanding and recognizing it. So go back to that why question that I asked on the second slide. Why are they coming back? What do they want to get out of it? That'll help you set the what and the how. Use of equipment on hand, and I got a slide I think that shows a bit, but just different physical barriers. What do you have in your rink? How can you set it up to make things easier or to make it so that there are things that the kids can work with uh, without having interaction with, with humans or other coaches, whether it's garbage cans or barriers or coach mates or things like that, pylons, all of that stuff can end up making a difference and helping out with the planning side of it. Um, the other one, and I might have it in another slide, but just came up is, uh, yeah, actually I do. So I'll leave that one. And uh, the pen in the hand preparation. And what I mean by that, um, again, if you've worked with me before, uh, you would know that uh, I don't create every drill, uh, excuse me, in every practice. Uh, you might have a skeleton of what it's going to be. And pen in hand means everybody has a chance to jump in and give ideas their ideas of what the station could look like or what the drill is. So it's an empowerment of everybody building the drills and the practice. It's not just one person doing it. Again, the more hands and the more, the more energy that people give, the better off you're going to end up being with that. So with the ice and coach utilization, and here's where I put down some diagrams on the side too, but we'll go through the reading first and then I'll explain a little bit about the diagrams. But the first one is the, the, the protocols, the number of participants and the social distancing. So how many are you gonna have on the ice? Is there gonna be nine kids and one coach, two and eight? How is it gonna end up being? And then making sure no matter what, that they're all social distancing. So as I'm talking, you take a look at the diagrams and these are ones that we at Hockey Alberta came up with, uh, the three different rinks and ideas of it. And every one of them, they're social distanced properly. And the coaches are in really good spots to be able to help the kids. So these are gonna be some ideas for you when you're looking to plan what you're gonna do as far as how you can line the kids up and sort of how you can split the ice up as well uh, to make it effective for everybody. And you'll notice in some of them, there's nets and there's, you could end up having shots in that. So you're incorporating goalies as well. Again, depending on the age and what you wanna end up getting out of the practice. <clears throat> The use of ice time and, and again, just phoning around and putting some things together. Uh, one of them is less floods. Less floods means more time. So if you've got three uh, U9 groups going on one after another, you really don't need to flood the ice if you don't want to, because what that means, uh, you can leave the equipment up for the next group too. They're not gonna chew the ice totally up. So it means you might get an extra five to seven minutes of, of skating time and you're not setting equipment up. But again, that goes back to my pen and hand theory of having to have people talk to one another to accept it and say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's end up doing that. And again, you just set it up with the rinks in advance, probably good for the rink guy too. He doesn't have to work as hard. Other than if it's older guys, uh, they might chew the ice up a lot. I know when we do our provincial camps, uh, we talk about ice utilization in a different way. But if you're using pylons, you keep moving them because they cut the ice up. And when you get into the, some of the other parts of your practice, the ice might be really chewed up where you don't want it to be. And then this, the, the skill and drill choices that you're going to use when we talk about the use of ice time. So what are the things that you want to do? And are there things? And if you look in that middle diagram there, once you've got the kids going on either end, they basically can run on their own. You don't need to be the guy telling them to go, go, go and you give them different skills to do around those borders and they will do them and work on it. And then you can do your coaching one-on-one. -on -one. And again, you notice that if you put pylons out behind there, they all know where they're gonna stand when they come back in. And again, that's for the younger ones, but even the older ones, uh, we were talking today at Hockey Alberta and some of it, those older kids it's, and, I, and those of you that are coaching uh, U11 and up, uh, they're gonna cheat on drills. So if you tell them to, to do crossovers all the way around the circle or touch up at the blue line. Uh, after a few uh, reps, uh, lots of them start cutting the corner. And so that's again, what we don't want. And it's something for you as a coach to uh, keep in mind is they're gonna cut corners. So if you can put pylons out or whatever, so that they know where to stand, is probably a really good idea. 
the use of the ice surface. And again, this is one where once you get a drill going, if you use a circuit, everybody goes. Nobody's really standing still. So if they're going, if you've got a half an hour or an hour of ice, you can have them guys going almost the whole time. And again, it's just repetition, getting lots of shots, working on your edges, whatever it happens to be that you're going to work on. And one thing I didn't put in there when we, when we talk about practice is just theming your practice. You might have one that's basically themed on skating and puck handling, another one skating and shooting, another one skating and checking, another one, whatever it is. You've always got the skating part in, but you're going to put other parts in that's going to keep the kids fresh. And they know this day they're going to get that. And I know when we do stuff at our provincial camps, when the players know that we're doing a day that's called with the puck stuff, it's going to be a fun day. There's tons of puck touches, uh, lots of shots on goal, lots of opportunities, et cetera. And so they like those sorts of things. So I should have probably added in here theming it. Um, and also with the use of ice surface, there's a lot of puck touches, which I think is really important. And stats uh, bear that out. And in practice, they touch it a lot more than in a game. The coaching opportunities, well, we can progress and regress. And that's where the second one with the groupings. Uh, when you've got any one of those setups that I've shown on the right-hand side, you can end up grouping your kids. Whether you just throw them in, it doesn't matter who it is, or you heterogeneously group, or pardon me, homogeneously group them to where you've got skill with skill. So you're, you're regressing or you're progressing a certain drill based on um, the skill level of your kids. So again, if I go to that second drill, and we do the one on the, the right-hand side where they're just going at sort of like a figure eight around the bumpers. If they're very weak with their edges, maybe they're not even gonna use pucks to start with. And then you're gonna progress it to maybe they get a puck and they're, all you're worried about is just two edges. The older that they get, you can have them uh, sculling around. Uh, you can have them doing a crossover around and accelerate out of it. You can have them doing heel to heel coming out of it. Like again, it's just a matter of where they are. So I wouldn't tell you one way or the other with this coach opportunity, but if it's me, I would probably homogeneous group them and it's a little bit easier to run the ends or whatever station that you're going to work on. And you're working with more like athletes that are, that are in it. And the kids and parents might know, but again, that you're the coach and you're setting it up based on you want them to improve their skills. Um, and the last one is the individual feedback. And, and again, if you take a look at where we put the coaches in this, once the drill gets going, depending on what it is, the coach has opportunity to give feedback to the kids. They can float around and talk. And one of the things I learned a number of years ago, I went out and did a little wee kid session and there was two teams on the ice, one at each end. So I worked with one group first and they were doing a drill and uh, they had to stop at some pylons and and then do a tight turn and go in and shoot. And so I think there was five pylons. And so I asked the kids, uh, you know how to count the two, right? And they all went, yeah. And I see you know how to count the three, yeah. Okay, so when the kid in front of you gets to the third pylon, you're allowed to go. So I'm working on timing because there was a goalie at the other end. And these kids were like eight years old, they were young. No problem with that at all. They ended up going through it. If I wanted to stop them, I would bring them all in, whatever. But I'm teaching them hockey sense too. They have to keep their head up. They have to pay attention. They got to know when it's their turn to go. And it's a little bit about timing because at the end of the day, you don't want two of them shooting at the goal at the same time if one of the players in front lost their puck. So I go down to the other end to ask the coach because they were doing the same thing. He wanted no part of me. He wanted to run it on his own. So we had every kid standing in the line waiting till the one in front finished it. And then he had a coach standing at the line and what the coach was doing was telling the next one to go. Well, the side I was working on, I deployed one coach at each set of pylons to work so that they could talk to the kids about edges and about how to hold their hands going around, turning a corner, and another one down there to do give and goes with the kids for shooting or stick handle around them. So the coach use and ability that we had of them, their job description, completely changed. And the only thing that changed was the kids were the ones that knew when to start. So again, I go back to this here with that ice utilization, and it sounds really simple, but they're coming back to a situation where they haven't had a practice in a long time. So some of this stuff will really help them as well going through it. Like I say, Joel, I'll hand you this PowerPoint over. So all of them will have these diagrams, some really good stuff on it, actually, I thought, some good ideas, and there's probably a lot more.
So what I ended up getting into prior to this recent announcement is doing a whole lot of, uh, of work with people doing things off ice. And so I just stuck a few things down here to give you some ideas. But again, all of this is in that resource package that Joel will end up getting. So you guys will get it all. There's probably 10 different documents. And the one has probably now about 40 different team building uh, ideas, uh, creative things that you can end up doing. So as I learned a new one, I just stuck it in, stuck it in. So there's lots of great ideas. Around Christmas, uh, one group that I was doing things with shared with me that they, they did an advent calendar, but they didn't have chocolate in it. Every day, uh, one of the kids, uh, and they were doing Zoom calls, every day one of the kids had to have a new drill uh, for the kids to end up doing and trying. And then they had it, they had the video for like 10 seconds. So Joel, you're doing one on toe drags, your day one with this advent calendar. So you show us how to do it. And then every one of us had to go out and do it. And maybe it was a challenge. How many toe drags can you do in 30 seconds, 10 seconds? So day two, Barry, it's your turn. And Barry's going to end up doing passing off the boards. How many times on a forehand can I do it? I thought it was an outstanding idea. And it's maybe even something now that you can do on ice with the players. Uh, lots of them, they've got the outdoor rinks and stuff like that. But it was a really good way to team build uh, without an actual practice going on. You could also do it using some of the ideas in a couple of the other um, little quadrants that I put there where you're looking at one is the, the hockey analysis. So you're going to pick a game. You're going to pick the Oilers. You're going to pick McDavid or Nurse or whoever it is. And then you're just going to look at how they play the game. And you as a coach, depending on the age of the kid, you can ask them to identify skills that they've done, things that they've done well, how many face-offs they won, how do they win a face-off, sky's the limit. They're watching a game not just to see who scores the goals and the highlights, they actually have to watch the game. As they get older, maybe you can ask them more in-depth questions. So I thought that was a good idea. Another one at the bottom right. Uh, was a movie night where you get the kids all to watch a movie on Friday night, Coach Carter, and ask them the questions like, what makes a great teammate? How come that team was successful? What, what were things that they got to do throughout the movie that got them to the point they were? Uh, Remember the Titans is another really good one, like any of those. So again, the kids like watching TV, and you're getting them to watch a sports movie of some sort, and they have to analyze it. Sky's the limit with a question like that. So a couple people had asked Joel about ideas off ice with a team building. There's a few good ones. And like I say, that resource package has a ton of them in there. Um, I also put in at the bottom right quadrant when I ran my, my skill academy in Spruce, whatever we did on ice, we did off ice. So if we were doing uh, toe drags on ice, off ice, we worked on them before we went on and even after just to keep practicing. So what we tried to teach the kids is we're emulating what we're doing on ice to off ice so that they could practice and they would want to. And what I had them do in their basement or garage or wherever is you see a whole bunch of different patterns there. I had them use masking tape, put it on the floor. And we did that in the gym or wherever we were uh, in, in the hockey academy. And when they were off ice, they would work on patterns. They would work on letters. And so again, they can do it all on their own and uh, they just get better at handling a puck or whatever it is that you get them to do. And that could fit in even with the advent calendar, call it something different and every day give them a different pattern that they got to work on for homework. And again, if kids are hungry to want to get better now, go back to the why question and then go to the how and the what. If they're hungry to learn, challenge them with this stuff, get them to do it and then get them to demonstrate it on the ice when they come. Everybody who is working on that W at home, we're going to spend two minutes on it. I want to see everybody and how fast you can end up doing it. So now it's a compete. It's a personal challenge. You're throwing it out at them and you're seeing who's doing their homework. And then you go back to the one where kids are quitting because maybe we're not giving them enough positive feedback. Well, guess what? That's a great chance for you to offer them that feedback. The book, Sometimes You Win and Sometimes You Learn. I have uh, two redheaded grandsons. And one that isn't a redhead, but as much the same too, they hate losing. And so as a grandparent, I bought this book. Uh, they've all read it with me at least once, maybe more. And it's one that I use now all the time with coaches that I work with. Sometimes you're gonna win, but sometimes you're gonna learn. And instead of you calling it losing, you're actually learning. 
what didn't we do well? And even when you win, and I think we all know it, you could sweep it under the carpet and say, hey, we got two points or we won, but there was probably a whole bunch of things that we could have done different. So why I put the book in there is there's another off ice opportunity for you. Get them to read something. Maybe it's a chapter a night. Um, I was gonna put something on mental performance in here, but I wasn't sure of the age and that of the audience, but maybe it's something on that, or maybe it's on that book I just said, Extreme Ownership or whatever it is. Read a chapter and then zoom it and talk about it. What did you learn? What are some things that you got out of it? How can we use that moving forward? And again, you're not building your team because there's not going to be games, but you're not quitting on them. And you're trying to teach them for next year. And whether you're coaching them or somebody else is, you're helping them along in their journey. And again, the challenge I threw back to you earlier on, you're outside the box thinking and trying some different stuff, which is really cool and really important for us as coaches to be working on. <clears throat> Resources. Uh, the biggest one, and in talking with a number of different people, obviously Hockey Alberta, uh, Joel and the Hockey Edmonton crew there has stuff for you. But if you're on the Hockey Alberta or Hockey Canada Network or the hub, that one there has tons of good ideas. And for right now, for the skill development side of it, um, Corey's done a great job with putting together video and practice plans and everything else for you. To me, I would suggest going on there. If you're not on it, um, I think, Joel, it's 40 bucks or something to get on. Is it, is it still around that? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it costs you a few dollars, but $40, you've got it for a year, and you've got a whole lot of opportunity to learn some new stuff. The other reason I threw this on is if you take a look at the diagrams on the left side, you notice that it's full ice and there's four lanes. You might only use three if you've got littler kids, but guess what? You could have all your kids. Uh, on the ice, doing up and down, things like that, and being socially distanced. So there's another idea for you as far as how to set the ice up to make it work for you. Even if you just split it into two halves, you could still do that three or four lane skating. And I've used that for years, both for warmups, as well as puck handling and balance and things like that, the skating stuff. You can teach a ton there. You can do outside edge, inside edge, uh, heel to heels and striding like you could do that and they could keep going for 10 minutes skating go to backwards and do things with that again simple easy to set up lots of reps the kids are getting something out of it without a puck then give them a puck and have them do the same thing with it give them two pucks to have to do those things down there now we're into stuff that the uh the europeans do with two and three pucks at once where the brain you have to use both sides of your brain plus your feet and hands and everything to do it. So you're engaging everything in your body. Lots of different ideas there. <clears throat> uh, somebody asked to talk a little bit about parents. And honestly, um, players are a product of their environment. I don't wanna get too much into it. But what I tried to do is give some hints um, as far as things that you should think of in order to help your parents and especially now. Tell them in the next six weeks, here's what our vision is. Here's what we're gonna try and do with our kids. And that goes to the third point of transparency. Tell them, be open about it. Let them know what their kids are gonna get so that they know going in, because most of them won't be able to get into the ring. So they're gonna be wondering what the heck's going on and where their money's going. Connect with the parents, do a Zoom call with them, have that meeting to explain those things with them and tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it. Don't be afraid. Player first, development, that's what it's all about. And it should be all the time anyways, no matter what level you're coaching, unless it's the NHL. You're about developing those kids to get to the next level, that's your job. I don't care if you're coaching midget AAA now, it's not even in a regular year, it's not about winning the league, it's about getting your kids ready to play junior hockey, to either get a scholarship or to play pro hockey if that's what their desire is. And most kids in AAA, that's what it is. We're about developing them and giving them chances. Empower your parents, get them to do some things. And maybe it's up to them to organize the Zoom calls and, and do some of this team building stuff. Uh, again, we found with our provincial teams, the more we empowered our parents, the more they bought into stuff and the less hassle we had with them. Be an active listener, talk to them, ask them, have a Zoom call after with that transparency piece and ask them, what do you kids think? Are they liking it? Is there stuff we, that we're missing? 
again, that whole thing about the why, the what and the how comes back at us. If you can figure that out, you'll please everybody over the next way. And the last one is that two-way accountability. You're accountable too, not just them. You've got to make each other accountable for their, for their kids. The sign in the left-hand corner, that's normally how most coaches treat parents. Danger, thin ice, stay away. Please don't. I'm going to show you a video. I hope it works. Uh, Joel, if it doesn't, just sort of tell me that the volume isn't coming through. Because the one thing I forgot to do when I did this is I did not activate the volume. Okay. okay. There's no, no volume, Barry. No volume? Okay. Okay, when you get the when you get this, um, when you get the PowerPoint, you will end up getting that slide, and it's called Trophy Kids. What it's about is a number of different parents that are on their kids for different reasons: work ethic, not trying, whatever. And it just shows how parents act to some of that stuff and how animated they get. Why I wanted to show you isn't so that you can throw darts at, at parents. It's so that you understand they love their kids. They want their kids to succeed. They're willing to do anything they possibly can to help their kids get there. They live vicariously. They're gonna push them. They're gonna do all of those things. So at the end of the day, if you can understand who they are, what they are, where they're coming from, it'll make a big difference for you as you move on. Anyways, that was sort of the purpose of that slide was just to show an appreciation for that side of it. They love their kids. So where are we now? What should we focus on? So I'm now going again to another bit of a tangent here. And what we want to look at is what should we focus on moving forward? Things that matter and things that you can control. And it's really important for you to understand that. And the question probably that comes out is how can you control it? So the little um, uh, equation at the bottom, events are gonna happen. Sometimes we can control them, sometimes we can't. So you look at COVID, we can't control it, but we can control the response that we have to it if we want to. So how have we responded to it? Positively, negatively, have we done things? Have we gotten better, et cetera, et cetera? And that will influence some of the outcomes that happen, not all of them. So the simple equation goes on with, uh, I read another book, um, and this one here was a really cool one. Uh, it talked about to start with that life uh, is like being in a pot of hot water. So if you think right now that pot of hot water is COVID and it's really hot. And if you put your hand to the steam or put it inside, you're gonna burn yourself. Bad things are gonna happen. And so what the book went into talking about was it used the metaphor of, um, of uh, some different things. So the first one here is carrots. And when, when carrots are outside the water, they're crisp, they're firm, they're hard, uh, they're crunchy, uh, all of those things taste good. You put them in hot water, what happens to them? Well, they get soft, they weaken. Uh, their power and the force is uh, more outside than inside. It just changes them, that whole weakness side of it. The environment has changed the carrot. It's made it weaker. And again, so we've got to think about that environment changing the carrot. That's probably something that it can't control. So then you look at an egg going in the opposite way. It's soft when it goes in, it comes out hard. Maybe as a person, it comes out, it's mean, it's angry, it's negative. Uh, it hates people, it points fingers, it does all of those things. And again, metaphor for people going into that hot water. So some people are carrots, some people are probably eggs. And in both cases, putting them in that hot water, the environment has affected them. Well, the coffee bean, any of you that, uh, that um, use, um, you, you use the uh, uh, coffee that you just put the beans in and then you pour hot water on it and you French press it and 10 minutes later, you drink a really good cup of coffee. Well, guess what? It's the coffee bean that's affected the environment. It's not vice versa. It has changed the hot water. And so the whole analogy here, coaches, and this would be another one if I gave you a second tip on what you should learn tonight is this one, is you need to teach yourself and your players and your parents that they should be a coffee bean. They shouldn't be a carrot and they should not be an egg. Don't go in soft and come out hard and negative or go in hard and come out soft and weak. 
Go in like a coffee bean. Affect the environment, don't let it nail you. And I've learned that, I read that book really early on in COVID and it's made a world of difference for me. Every day that something's not right or I'm thinking of this or that, and it starts to go that way, I think of the coffee bean. And whether I go make a cup of coffee or I just end up taking that two minute break and thinking about, hey, how can I affect the change here to make it positive? And honestly, it works. Uh, adversity and why I put this in is this group of people were coffee beans. Another book that I read during this pandemic, I read quite a few. And this one really got me because it was about a group that Shackleton put together um, years ago, late 1800s, to sail to the, uh, to the South Pole. And you can see by the ship at the top, it didn't quite make it. Uh, they got icebound early. Uh, they had to live a whole winter on that boat. There was 27 of them. And if you think poor me right now with COVID and I've only got Netflix and I've only got my phone and uh, I got to work from home, uh, but I can go to the grocery store and get food whenever I want and I can have a hot shower and stay warm. This group of people, completely different. They had so many obstacles to end up fighting through to make it through, it was incredible. He picked this group uh, very purposefully. He had one guy that was a singer, another one that was a jokester, another one that was a botanist, another one that was a map maker, et cetera, et cetera. Every person on that 27 man crew was picked, handpicked for a reason. And you can see in the bottom left, some of the things when he put in the paper, uh, as far as the help wanted at, some of the things that he ended up wanting in it. Coming out of that, they were there for more than a year. He left with seven, uh, ended up coming back and picking the rest up uh, the following summer. Uh, so they survived, there wasn't one person died. And if you wanna talk about adversity and perseverance and resilience and all of that, that's as far as you need to go. And it's another must read book when you have a chance. Um, those are typically not books I would read, but I tell you, he taught me a lot about pandemic and about leadership and about choices and about the coffee bean and all of that stuff, how important it is. What is a coach? Uh, this is another book. Uh, it's written by Don Shula and it's called uh, something about coaching. Um, I don't have the actual term, everybody's a coach. And what he put in there that I really liked is a coach is conviction driven, which I think all of us are because we're on tonight listening to me talk. Uh, we're over learning, which again is another one tonight uh, that you're trying to learn a little bit more, which I think is important. We're audible ready. If we haven't been the last nine months, we better be now in the next six to eight weeks. Uh, we wanna be consistent in our approach to things and that way their kids can read us and understand what we're trying to do. And we need to be honest, both with ourselves and also with the people that we're working with. So to me, uh, when we look at what a coach is, those are five words. And I just thought it was really good to end up sharing with you about it. And then obviously one of the, the deans of, of all in, in the coaching world um, is uh, John Wooden. And uh, I really truly believe in this part, a good coach can change a game, but a great coach can change a life. And it's another one, if you haven't read anything by him, you should because it'll change your life, not only as a coach, but also as a person. Somebody asked him once, uh, do you consider yourself a good coach? And he said, I don't know, ask me in 25 years when, you, when, when these guys get older. So again, it's not about the here and now, it's about the life skills and everything else. And that guy won 10 championships in the world, at the college level, pretty impressive. So some sage coaching questions to ponder. I'm throwing some stuff at you to think about. I've given you a whole bunch of stuff. So what have you learned? What can you plan for? And can you be a bit of a Yoda in all of this? So the first one, and probably a lot of you are asking yourself prior to, how can I engage the players? What can I end up doing now to start to get my kids to be engaged in this? Whenever the first ice session is going to be, and I threw a bunch of ideas at you from Zoom conferences to if you're on Snapchat or whatever else, any of those things. The next one, what does my association in Hockey Edmonton want from me? Maybe they all they want is skill development. And I know phoning some of the smaller communities, what they've done is um, they're basically washing the air away with the kids and uh, they're, they're refunding and everything else. And they're saying, if you want to come to a session, it's going to be skill development. And we've got our, our coaches coaching. It's going to be cheap because we're not paying for that side of it. 
and it's going to cost you X amount of dollars. So they, they're running it as skill sessions. Other groups, and I know my two grandsons in Spruce Grove, both of them, they're running them as teams because they've done stuff throughout this whole time as a team. They want to end the year as a team. So again, what does your association want? Um, and what do you want at the end of the day? How is that going to end up fitting so that you can make it work? How should I set up a practice? Well, I gave you a bunch of ideas. You'll get this PowerPoint and it'll give you some ideas. Go to that hockey hub, uh, empower others to help you out, all of that stuff. What skills are important to teach? Well, I can't think of better guys than one like Joel or that hockey hub that's got a whole bunch of stuff for initiation, novice, sorry, U7, U9 uh, levels. And it will give you all the skills that the kids need to have moving forward. So what are things that you think they could work on? And again, if you forget the stuff that you were doing at the beginning of the year, maybe that's what you go back to is some of those things. Basic things that are gonna bring out their, their skill set and they're also gonna have fun doing. And the other one that I put there, an important one um, is, should I still focus on team or just players? Kind of talked about that already. And again, I think that depends on the situation that you put yourself in now and the team. So that one's up to you. If you wanna keep the team going, there's off ice stuff you can still do, there's on ice stuff that you can do, or you run it, like I say, as a skills, uh, program for the last little bit. And the last question that I sort of thought might be important is how do I keep everyone on the same page and how do I keep them positive? And that might be other than maybe how do I engage the players, the second most important thing. You want this next six to eight weeks to be the best that it could possibly be for everybody. And I think if you can do that, you'll accomplish a lot and you'll leave people in that book before the lights go out you'll leave them wanting next year to start to happen again versus, geez, I'm glad hockey's over. I think we're going to ski next year or do whatever because lots of people are starting to think that way. I'm sure you've heard this before, uh, talk lots about, but just about comfort zone. And we're so lucky, I guess, in a lot of ways that we can be in our comfort zone, whether it's our job, our family, or coaching, whatever it is, and we feel really good in it. But like the diagram says, it's outside is where all the magic happens. And sometimes we win and sometimes we learn. I think now's the time for you guys to sort of challenge yourself and make some of that magic happen outside of your comfort zone. Get out there and, uh, and do a little experimenting. You don't remember when you learned how to, to walk, you, when you learned how to ride a bike, when you learned how to talk, how many times you fell or couldn't pronounce words or whatever else. We don't remember that, but if we weren't resilient and persistent in those skills, we would never be doing what we're doing now. We'd still be crawling or rolling around on the ground. So you have it in you to make the magic happen for yourself and for your players. <clears throat> I, uh, I looked on, on uh, the web and I, uh, on your page, and I found one team, White Mud uh, 401s, uh, that they, they had their little, their little thing up there uh, with their jerseys. And uh, I want to leave you with, with a couple thoughts, and this is the first one, is leave the jersey in a better place. Another book, Legacy, talked about it. Uh, that was one of the commandments that was in it. But when you start something, as an organization and as a team and as a coach, uh, you want to leave the jersey in a better place. And, and it's funny, when I read that book, I'd done a lot of work with Hockey Alberta over the years prior to it and Hockey Canada and coached a lot of teams. And I started thinking back to all the teams that I coached, whether it was in school or on the ice, and uh, looked at pitchers and, and thought about, did I leave that jersey in a better place? Did I leave those kids somewhere where they succeeded and liked what they were doing and kept playing. Um, and uh, like I say, I got a couple on tonight for sure that I've taught and or coached. And I certainly hope that, uh, that I've left you in a better spot. Uh, you're on tonight. So obviously there's something there, whether it was me or 14 other coaches that you've had that have helped. But to me, you need to reflect on that as well. And I think this year is so important for all of us to really think about is have and are we going to leave our jersey in a better place? And again, that's maybe something when you're doing Zoom calls or talking to the parents or whatever, is 
how can we leave this jersey in a better place this year? It's been a shitty six months and we've all struggled through it. Let's finish strong and let's leave it really good for the kids. Great experience, a lot of fun. Uh, they've had the opportunity to finish off and, uh, and good things have ended up happening. No matter if you're running it as a team or skill-based, like I say. And again, those decisions only you and your staff can end up making. And I, I, I think the last one uh, to me is really important. I don't know if you guys read anything by John Gordon or if, you're, if you get his stuff daily. I bought a book of his too. Uh, but he really makes sense with his daily thoughts. And this one really hit home to me and, and that fitting for this whole journey is life is meant to be lived forward. Um, learn from the past, but don't live there. Today is a new day to create a better tomorrow. And when I talk to kids in mental performance and they fail at something, I tell them fail fast, fail hard and fail forward. And that's sort of what this quote is all about as well. We can't be afraid to fail and failures in the past, we gotta leave it, but we gotta learn from it. And we've gotta move on to create a better uh, next day, whatever that happens to be a game, a practice, uh, playing with your teammates, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, anyways, Joel, I'm, I'm done. Uh, I put on there any any questions, and I don't know if you've got stuff from people or if they're going to ask. However, you want to handle that part of it now. And I'll uh, let anybody give the I'll give you give you the chance to just submit through the the group chat if you have there, and I can manage that. Um, I'll give you a minute or two there. But I think you covered a lot of the stuff that we had that they submitted to that Excel sheet. There might be other things too. One thing for me is um, this is maybe more for like an elite stream of program is um, like, how do you, do you have any advice for when you're trying to give those players professional development through zoom, um, but then also mix in the team building. I, I have found that it's difficult to kind of find the right, balance of those two and if i have to kind of go back and start this over i probably would have done less professional development and maybe a bit more of the of the team building but um i think it's it's difficult at times when you're coaching players at a bit higher of a level to kind of figure out what they want from a professional development standpoint but then also what they need as a team from a um a team building standpoint so, well, we're, we're, yeah, where you're at with, with your group of kids is they're all trying to get scholarships. And so you can see where it can be a bit of a, an antagonism between the two things that you talked about. Um, one, you want to keep them together as a group. So it sounds like you've tried to do that. Uh, two is the other side of it, that they're, they're all trying to get something on their own. So that's where the development side comes in. And if you, you think what I talked about earlier on, uh, in regards to being able to mesh that piece of it is to, to ask them that why uh, early on um, so that you find out where they're coming from. And maybe like we've got Zoom now, I still don't know how to do it, but there's chat rooms and everything else that <clears throat> maybe that's one of the things. And especially like you say, if you're dealing with Bantam Midget AAA kids or U15, U18, U16 at that level <clears throat> that do have those sorts of questions, Maybe it's something where you can organize your Zoom calls that maybe the first half is a team builder, whatever it happens to be. Um, people have even done stuff, the cool one is cooking classes, where each week somebody or a group had to put together a meal and then everybody, they sent the recipe out and everybody had to do something. So first part of the call is fun. And then the second part maybe is something that's more sincere or guided towards them getting better, whatever it is, Joel, whether it's mental performance, choosing a school, what skills to work on in the basement, um, could be a whole bunch. Um, I've just found over time, but and I think maybe more so with those groups of kids, is they tend to be a little more focused on where their end goal is gonna be. Whereas when you're looking at the younger kids, and I would say even the U13s don't aren't there yet, maybe they have a goal of wanting to play in the Western League or something, but their, their cognitive abilities aren't there yet to get them there. They may want it so you can give them little spurts of it. 
but I think the older that they get, the more that they are cognizant of wanting something that's actually, hey, this is going to help me. Um, I know I've done some calls with just teams, uh, probably, I don't know, at least six different ones on different topics. And the coaches have asked, hey, can you help me out with something? Most of it's been mental performance stuff. Um, not, not as much on the side of scholarships and all of that side, although those questions do come out. Or how do you make Team Alberta's come out as well? So we've talked about that, but um, where you can narrow it down, and maybe that's another piece too, whether you've done it or not, and any other coaches on it, is to get speakers in that actually can, that's a specific topic they're going to give you for 15 minutes, half an hour, Q&A, whatever it is, right? Yeah. I don't know if that helped, but. No, no, that's good. I think you kind of, when you look back, <laughs> it's lots of different ways you do it different. And you know, yeah. we, did, we did ask the group what they wanted. And sometimes I think that they don't even know what they want, right? So just like us. Yeah, agreed. And sometimes they follow what their parents want. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think we have any any questions coming in, but uh, anybody else? Just some thank yous. So that was awesome, Barry. Thanks so much for uh, for doing that for us, and uh, uh, and I think we awesome to share the slide deck and the resources that you spoke about. We can chat about that after too, how we how we do that, but. Uh, that was uh, that was awesome. I really appreciate it, and really timely too with getting everybody back on the ice. So, well, you'll see when I send you it. I think it's volume four or five. So, when I started a, a week or so ago, and where I finished, just because of the announcements and some of the questions and that that came out, I had to keep changing it. But that's the fun part of it is I'm learning as well, and my job is to try and help as much as I can and share. So, yeah, awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, coaches and uh, whoever else on the call. And uh, thanks again, Barry, for doing this for us. And uh, lots of great information, as, as always, from you. And you've had a big impact on me since I've moved to Alberta and have another one today. So thanks very much for doing that for us. You're welcome. Thanks again for asking me. Have a good night, guys. Good luck with uh, the rest of the season.